Last time, we looked at how to add a Taptic engine to the iPod 4th generation. And while that's good and all, there are many other iPod models out there, including the Mini, the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th generation. Today we'll be looking at the iPod Mini. Now, I know lots of people are also interested in adding Taptic engines to the iPod 5th, 6th, and 7th generation, so don't worry about that. In the next video, we'll be looking at those. But for today, it's time for the Mini. The iPod we'll be working on today has both a dead hard drive as well as a worn-out battery, so we'll be replacing those in the video too. Now, something important to note is that when flash modeling the iPod, we need to be using a Type 1 card and not a Type 2 card. And the only difference is the thickness. Type 1 cards are several millimeters thinner than Type 2 and will need all that space inside the iPod in order to fit the Taptic engine. We'll begin by opening up the iPod Mini. Now, the Mini is held together by end caps on the top and bottom, and these are connected using glue as well as clips. So using a pry tool, we can just very slightly insert it into the gap between the back casing and the end cap. Now, we don't want to insert too far inwards, just one or two millimeters perhaps, because there are electronics behind it, so if we insert too far behind, we can damage the internals. Now, we just pry upwards slightly and then peel it like this. Eventually the glue will give way and the end cap can be removed. For the bottom end cap, it's the same story. Again, we just want to insert slightly and then gently peel. The bottom end cap does have slightly more clips, so just be careful and take your time. The internals of the iPod are held in place by two Phillips head screws at the top. But before we can remove those, we need to disconnect the click wheel, which is held underneath this metal clip. To do that, we're just going to use a very small flathead screwdriver and pry. Now, do be very careful because the click wheel connector is on this side, and if we insert too far in, we can end up damaging it permanently. So we're just going to start on this side first. We're going to gently just go down and pry upwards like that. There. Now, we only need to remove one more of these clips and the whole thing will fall out. And generally, I tend to go for the one on the back, because that's where the ribbon connector falls, and if we can so too far, we can damage it. So it's slightly less risk on this side. And just like that, the clip is out. And now here's the tricky part. The clickable ribbon is connected to a plug that's plugged into the main board. And a common problem people have is accidentally prying the ribbon off the plug and tearing it, which permanently damages it. And so in order to remove it, we need to get something thin, like either a price tool or tweezers. And make sure we insert it between the plug and the socket, and not between the ribbon and the plug. And we just gently pry. We don't need to pry all the way upwards, but gently loosen it from either side. and eventually the plug will come out. With the click wheel disconnected, we can now safely remove the two flipped head screws at the top. Now that the screws are removed, we can gently push the entire board assembly out through the top. And just like that, the internals are now free. First things first, we need to disconnect the battery to make sure everything's safe. And we're just going to gently pull up on the plug with a pair of tweezers and the battery is now disconnected. The micro drive is held together by a bunch of tape. So we just need to peel that up and then we can free the connection.
It's probably easier to use some kind of plastic spudger here, but just make sure you don't use metal in case it crosses the connections. And gently push, and the drive is out. Even though we're not working on the screen, we still need to remove it in order to free up all the space that we can work with later. Now the screen is held in place by this connection, as well as four plastic clips. So we can disconnect the screen by flipping up this connector here. And then the ribbon is now free. We can use our fingernails here just to gently pry the connection here. And the other side as well. Now we can just tilt up and gently pull until the screen comes out. The clicker speaker we'll be removing is actually located underneath this board here, and so we're going to have to unplug it. Now this is quite a tricky part again, because one common mistake is people pull too hard and then that destroys the connection on there, and we want to avoid that. So we're going to take a pair of tweezers and slide it into the connection here between the plug and the socket and just gently rock it until it comes out. So when you're doing this, just take your time and don't rush. Just make sure you can gently rock it like that. Eventually, the connection will loosen enough that you can just pull and the board comes out. With the bare board finally free, we can now turn our attention to the Saptic engine itself. Now, as always, make sure you're wearing eye protection for this bit. We're going to start off by removing these two tabs on the side with side cutters. So just grip them firmly, but instead of cutting them, gently rock them back and forth until they come off. And again with the other side. Like that. And now we won't be using this ribbon cable here because we will be soldering directly to a diagnostics pad. So we can remove that too. And now the Taptic engine is ready to go. As before, we'll be using alcohol and a cotton bud to remove the tape covering the hidden diagnostics port. So just gently wipe. These pads are still hidden under a layer of captain tape, which we need to remove. But we need to be very careful because this is still on the back of a very fragile ribbon connector, and if we pull too hard, there's a risk of puncturing it and damaging the connections. So take your time and just gently pull upwards. On the diagnostics port, we will be using the first and last pads, so I've used Capton tape to cover up the ones in the middle and pre tin the pads. Now it's time to attach the wires. Okay, now that the Taptic engine is all wired up, we can move on to the board itself. The clicker is this component here, and all I'm going to do is pull up using a pair of tweezers while melting the connections with my soldering iron. Once the joints are all disconnected, we can carefully remove the clicker from the board. Before we can solder the Taptic engine to the board, there's one other thing we need to do, and that's to fit and trim the flash adapter. Now, most CF cards and adapters have this little tab at the end here. And the problem is, that's going to prevent the card from sitting flush to the board. When that happens, it's going to reduce the amount of space we have on top, and that's where we're going to be putting the Taptic engine, so we need to just trim that down. For this, I'll be using the edge cutters, and then with the remainders, I'll be using a file. After a bit of trimming, we can see that the adapter is flat, and it's time to install it. I've also put some double-sided tape on a bang, just so that I can sit flush properly with the board. To install the adapter, all you need to do is line it up with the pins and insert it. Just like that. And now, gently apply some pressure 
and hopefully the double-sided tape should attach it to the board. Now you can see it sits flush, so we have plenty more space up there for the Taptic engine. In terms of positioning, I've placed this Haptic engine in the bottom right corner here, and I've fed the wires through to the left, all the way up, and around to the contacts. The original speaker had three contacts, here, here, and here, and we only need to use these two. And because it's using an alternating current, it doesn't matter which wire goes to which. So all that's left to do now is to solder them into place. Okay, with the Taptic engine in, we can start finally putting everything back together, starting with the headphone board. Now, there's something we need to be aware of here. The headphone board requires a lot of pressure to properly reconnect, and that's the reason why we remove the screen, because if we put it here and then push hard like this, we'll definitely break the screen. So, just align it, and then push. And keep pushing until you can feel a click, like that. The first time when I was doing this, I didn't actually press it in properly, even though it looked like it was connected, which is why when I put everything back together, the headphone wasn't working properly. It's making really weird noises. So if that happens, that's probably why. Just make sure you reconnect it properly. Next, we can reattach the screen. So just align the ribbon cable with the slot and push it firmly inwards. You can also use a fingernail just to grip it slightly and pull it like that. Make sure that the first white line is just below the connector and the second one is just outside. And then we can just flip down the clip and that should secure the connection in place. Now, all we need to do is just clip on the four connectors on the side. And with that, the screen is now in place. Sometimes when you reconnect the screen, it might suddenly come on with all the pixels looking a bit crazy. That's normal, don't worry about it, and it'll eventually go away when you turn it on. Finally, we can put the battery back. So we just push the connector in, and slot it in like this. Now I'm also going to take a piece of tape and just hold it down like this. That way the battery doesn't flop around when I try to put it back into the casing. It's going to be slightly tricky sliding it back in. But if we just put it in like this and slide it. In most cases, the logic board will get stuck here, and that's quite normal. So if that happens, don't force it downwards because there's a quite a high chance you can break something on a logic board. Instead, we're going to use one of these tools, just slide it in, and we're going to slightly wedge the board down to clear any obstructions, like so. And while doing this, sometimes the battery might tilt downwards like this. Just make sure that it's always pushed back in place like that, and so that it doesn't fall out. And eventually, the board will start sliding in. Just before you slide it in, make sure that the battery cable is properly slotted in. In this case, you can see it's come out slightly, so we just need to pull up slightly and realign the cable. Like that. Before we plug the click wheel back in, we just need to make sure that the logic board is held in place by the two screws at the top. The reason why we're doing it in this order is because we want to make sure the logic board is held in place when we work with the click wheel ribbon. If we plug it in and the logic board slides around at any point, there's a risk that it can fall out and then tear the cable, and we want to avoid that. Okay, now that's held in place, we can plug the click wheel in. And we can just give it a quick test. If we give it a quick scroll... Can you hear that? That means that the Taptic engine is now working and giving us haptic feedback through the click wheel. Excellent. Now that we've tested the Taptic engine and can confirm it works, we can put the final touches on it. To put the metal bracket in, we just need to align one side of it, and then push on the other side. Sometimes it won't go in all the way, 
and to help us we can just use a flathead screwdriver just to bend the clip back in slightly until it goes back in. As for the end cap, there's a specific way it goes. If you look at it like this, you can see that there's actually a plastic bracket down here, and that's actually the bottom edge, whereas the open side is the top edge. You can also tell by looking at the clips. The top edge should only have one set of clips, while the bottom edge has two. So it should go in like this, with the top side on this side. Just press until it clicks in, like that. Now for the top, before you attach it, just make sure that the hold switch is in line with the switch here. Make sure that they're both in the hold position, because if they're not in line and you press it down, there's a risk of snapping this off the board. And push. This one doesn't really click, but as you can see, the hold switch is working. And now, we have a working iPod Mini with a Taptic engine. So there you have it. We now have a flash modded iPod Mini with a brand new battery and a Taptic engine. Because of the all metal body, the haptic feedback actually carries much better than the 4th generation. So, we've done the 4th generation and the Mini. That leaves the iPod 5th, 6th and 7th generation, and we will be going through them all in the next video. I would also like to thank the members of the iPod Modding and iPod Hogwarts Discord servers for the time and feedback while making this video. Hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time.